I want to take you to a familiar passage of Scripture. In fact, I think I may have spoken from this same text in this church. 2 Kings chapter 4, the Bible says, There cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? What do you have in your house? She said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. It's almost as if that pot of oil was an afterthought. It bore the resemblance of no significance. Because her first comment was, I don't have anything. I don't have anything in the house. Oh, except this. I've got a, I've got a pot of oil. In the ESV, Elisha says, what shall I do for you? She says, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. Borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons. I think I've skipped the verse here. Borrow not a few in verse 3. Verse 4. When you are come in, you shall shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out unto, into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. What do you have in your house? I don't have nothing in my house. She had something, but she didn't know what she had. She had something that she didn't recognize the importance and the value of what she had, the significance, the anointing, the potential for the miraculous. It was all in the house. Atlantic District, for just a few minutes tonight, I want to preach to you this. The miracle is in the house. The revival, it's already in the house. It's here right now. Can we lift our hands and let's pray. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your presence that's here. Thank you, Lord, for this group from NCC and the students who have led us in worship. Thank you for what we're feeling right now, how you're ministering to us in our spirits. I pray in the name of the Lord that the presentation tonight, that Brother Raymart laid before us, God, that it would grip our hearts and grip our spirit. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us realize that there is miracle in the house. There is opportunity in the house. Everything we need to move forward, it's already in the house. And let us not be like this widow woman who did not see the value of what was there already. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? God bless you as you're being seated today. I just want to begin tonight by telling you that I believe that God is ready for an outpouring. Does anybody believe that tonight? Come on, if you don't believe that, you can be dismissed. But for those of y'all that believe it, I want to to hear if you believe it. We've been doing this all this time. 
We've been praying all these years. We've been preaching this message all this time. You taught us this in Sunday school. You preached this to us in youth service. You've been telling us all this time that God wants to do something. We've come to a place where we've got to go ahead and believe it and get a hold of it. I believe, and I believe that I know that God is ready for an outpouring of his spirit on this world. He told his disciples in John chapter 4, He said, do not say that yet there are four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white with harvest. That tells me something right there. Some people can look at the harvest and see nothing. Somebody else can look at the harvest and see that it's ripe and ready. Hallelujah. He is speaking to them and he is saying, you can't see the harvest, but I can see the harvest and I am ready for it. I want to tell you tonight, I want to be among those who are seeing the harvest. I want to be among those that are searching for the harvest, discovering the harvest, putting my awareness on what God is available and ready to do. God has plans for an outpouring. He's not just ready for an outpouring. I believe that he has a strategic plan for an outpouring. If you'll look in the scripture and see that in God's creative design, he initiates life that is equipped to multiply. What he used to make Adam, he took from the dust. What he used to create Eve, he took from Adam, from Genesis 1, 11 and forward, whenever he creates something living, it has the elements within itself to reproduce itself, the seed within itself to bring forth after its kind. The grass and the plant kingdom is equipped to reproduce itself. The, the animal and the human body, male and female, is born equipped to cooperate together to equip and reproduce itself. Every egg that a female human body will ever need or ever reproduce is in their body when they are born. From the moment that she is born, every egg she will ever need to have any child she will ever have is already in her because God is always planning for expansion and God is always planning for reproduction and God is always in the business of most multiplication. That's the God that we serve. He wants to grow. Some people say you're always talking about church growth. Why are all these preachers always so serious about church growth? Can I tell you why? Because God is serious about church growth and evangelism and discipleship. For this widow woman in the book of 2 Kings, she came to a place of urgency because that creditor had come. There was a, a moment of crisis. And in order to avoid losing what she had, she was desperate for a miracle. If we've ever seen a time in our world today where the creditor has come and it's time to pay up, it is right now. We are seeing the signs of the times all around us. Even so much demonstrated in the last several days in Israel, we are seeing so many signs of the end time that are imminent and upon us. And I want to say that the creditor has come for this world. And we owe this world a revival. I don't know if you like to hear it said like that, but we owe this world a revival. We owe this world a revival. We owe the world what God has done for us, what God has saved us from, what God has brought us from. The world is owed that experience. And we owe this world a church that is to be on fire for God. This world is owed a church that's chasing the will of God, that's serious about evangelism. It's serious about discipleship, serious about planting churches, not chasing numbers just for recognition, but chasing God growth so that we can have restoration and reconciliation in every city and every province of our community. This world is tired of religion and religious groups. It's tired of rhetoric. It's tired of dead, lifeless church that's not changing anybody. So I say today that the apostolic church is under a mandate to our generation. The apostolic church, hallelujah, is under a mandate from God. The hurting is saying we are owed a healer. The lost are looking for an Acts 2.38 salvation. The bound are owed deliverance. The 
sad are looking for joy. The defeated are looking for victory. The depressed are looking for relief. The oppressed are looking for relief. The lonely are looking for a friend that sticks closer than any brother. And those that are in error, whether they know it or not, they are hungry for the truth. This is our job. This is our mandate. This is what God has called us to do. Hallelujah. And if we're going to satisfy the creditor, then we need churches, we need disciples, we need evangelists, and we need missionaries who are going to go into this world and carry the gospel. Tonight I have to just pause here to say that there may be someone even here in this service tonight that this is personal because the creditor has come in your life and you need something from the Lord. You're in a desperate moment in a crisis time and your family is on the line. Marriages and kids are on the line. I want to tell you tonight, this is the moment to reach out. The creditor has come, so let's turn to the Lord together. She was looking, if I interpret this story correctly, she was looking elsewhere for her miracle. She wasn't looking in her house. She was looking elsewhere. And no doubt she felt that her answer was going to come from an external source. When that creditor came, when that urgency came, she left the house looking for her answer. She left her house looking for salvation. And when Elisha gets involved, he immediately says, What shall I do for you? And before giving her an opportunity to answer, he points her back to her house. What shall I do for you? What do you have in your house? For Elisha, he returns her to that source immediately. She might have been looking for an answer outside, but he sends her back to her house. I want to talk to someone today who is looking at the face of, of a multicultural need looking at the desire for growth in your local church, at a district who is looking at a desire to plant 15 churches. And I want to talk to someone who feels like what you have is just too little. Like her, it's just nothing. I don't, I don't have anything. I have nothing but a pot of oil. Someone here tonight that feels perhaps like you don't measure up. I want to tell you that God will always use something that you've got. God always looks back to what you already have because he's already put something inside of you. He's already put a miracle inside of you. When God called you, there was something that he put in there from the very beginning. It was there all the time. God wants to use something that you've got. Hallelujah. And when God gets ready to multiply you, he'll use not an external thing many times. He'll use what you already have. He used a rib from Adam to make Eve. Hallelujah. He, he took 5,000 and fed them from one little child's lunch. It was there all the time. The rib was in Adam all the time. That little lunch bag was in the crowd all the time. Hallelujah. The Philistines were about to destroy Samson, but he reaches around and he finds the jawbone of an ass. It was there all the time. While he was thirsting and about to die, he had had a great miracle and now he needed another. But the Lord said, look where you are right now. You're tripping over the answer. You're tripping over the key. You're stumbling over what I can really use to do this miracle. Hallelujah. It was there all the time. Hallelujah. You know what you got to have? You, you, I don't have anything but a pot of oil. I, I remember somebody looked at a man and said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, such as I have. Hallelujah. Can we get a revelation tonight of what we already have? Can we get a revelation that this message, that this doctrine, that this truth, it is powerful. It is anointed. It's not just our background. It's not just our tradition. It's not just a handful of hodgepodge scriptures that have been meshed together to form a doctrine. But this is an experience that's already changed your life. What more proof do you need tonight? You've got something in the house that can change your life. Sometimes I think we need to be like that woman in Luke chapter 15 that had the ten coins and lost one. When she realized there was one missing, 
She got herself a broom, and she went through that house. She turned everything upside down because she knew it was in the house. Hallelujah. Miracles are going to happen when we start looking in our house. Miracles are going to start happening when we begin to look at the things that God has already done. Hallelujah. I can't preach this tonight. I don't have time to preach this tonight, but I just felt it drop in my spirit right now. What more do we need to see than the history of what God has already done? What God has already done is an enough of an example. What You don't even need faith because these are facts. These are historical facts. You don't even have to be some powerful supernatural believer. All you have to do is have the ability to remember when you were sick and now you're no longer sick. Remember when you were lost and now you are found. Remember what you were going through. Uh, you should have been dead a year ago. You should have been dead two years ago. You should have been gone. We shouldn't be here tonight, but thank God we are here it's a historical fact that God is able. So she goes to Elijah, and what we're seeing here is that he gave her the strategy to experience her miracle. And I believe that God wants to give us a strategy. When Jesus was preparing to feed the 5,000 and it became imminent that these people had to eat, they wouldn't. They weren't going to make it home without something. Jesus asked Philip, he said, where do we go to buy bread? But Philip didn't answer that question. Philip said, which wasn't even an answer at all, Philip said, we ain't got enough money for that. When I was a kid, my dad would have popped me upside the head. I didn't ask you what you had. He said, Where? Whence do we go? Whence will we buy all the bread that we need? Philip says, we don't have enough. Jesus asked where. Philip asked how. I think that's where we are sometimes. The how is always bigger than us. But Jesus does not expect us to always supply the how. He's interested if we have enough faith to go where it is. There's bread somewhere. When Jesus looks at the church and says, where are we going to go get it at? He's looking for us to get up and go looking for it. He's looking for us to get up and say, if you say go find it, then I believe that you've provided it somewhere. We don't need to be looking at God saying, I don't know if we can do this. I, 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 you know, I can't afford this. I don't know anything about other cultures. I don't speak another language. I don't know anything about people from these parts of the world. I don't eat that kind of food. There's hardly anybody in my community that I've been around and raised with that can help me understand the new cultures that are coming into this area. Jesus isn't asking you all that. He's just asking if you'll go there. He's asking if you will go there. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. The Lord is not trying to get you to come up with a strategy for the how. He just want to know, will you go and do what needs to be done here? I have already shown that I'm full of miracles. I have already shown that I can work the supernatural. When I say go find it, go find it. Don't try to explain to me how to do the miracle. I am the miracle worker. Hallelujah. I'm going to get distracted and start preaching another sermon here tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever felt like you just didn't know what to do? but you are sure that God was calling you to do something, this is where we are right now. Hallelujah. You are among ministers and church membership and pastors all over North America that are looking at a harvest field that is literally growing right in front of their eyes, feeling incapable, feeling like they don't have the answers, feeling like the, the societal boundaries that we've created, we can't say this and we can't say that and we're so afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. We have a literal fear of, of offending people right now because this world is in such a state of offense and I want to tell you what we are doing is we are we are distracting and we are we are backing up we are retreating into the how but the Lord is not worried about the how he's already got all that figured out what he wants us to do is just start saying if you say Lord that we can go find it let's go find it and I believe that as we begin to look at this community right here as we begin to look at the Atlantic District you're going to find we got something in this house right now we have something in the house in the Atlantic District. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not here tonight to, to, to measure or compare statistics because I'm sure there's some in the room that know this far better than me. But I have learned, and I feel like we've got about a, 
1.5 million or so people in these three, these three provinces. In New Brunswick, it's getting close to 800,000. In 2011, and I, I've been seeing, I told them at lunch today, I, I'm seeing some new verbiage. I look at a lot of these websites and a lot of these statistical data, and I'm seeing some new verbiage because it says in 2011, visible minorities accounted for 65.8% of recent immigrants in New Brunswick, while they make up 7.7% of immigrants who arrived before 1981. Combined, the four largest visible minority groups in New Brunswick in 2011 were blacks, Chinese, South Asians, and Koreans, accounted for 68.3% of the visible minority population. And what that means is, what I'm taking from this is to mean that the vast majority, some three-fourths of the majority of immigrants don't look like us because they're using this phrase, visible minorities, okay? According to uh, the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada Re Indian Register System, as of December 31, 2022, there's approximately 17,000 plus First Nations people in New Brunswick alone. Over 10,000 are on the reserve and 7,300 are off the reserve. About two-thirds of the population are English-speaking and one-third of the population is French-speaking. New Brunswick is home to most of the cultural region of Acadia and most Acadians. New Brunswick variety of French is called Acadian French and seven different regional accents can be found right here in this province. What am I, I'm, I'm talking about things that this is part of your life, not my life, your life. What I'm saying is this. You ain't got nothing in the house. There's something in the house. Oh, I just, just got a pot of oil. Oh, well, I, got a, I got a pot of oil that's a third of them speak a different language. I got a pot of oil that 68% of all immigrants don't look like the traditional church. This is what I'm seeing. We've got something in the house. Prince Edward Island, and he, here where I might, I might get you. Because as Multicultural Ministries Director, I often get some very curious questions. Prince Edward Island is 97.4% white. But it's also considered the most Scottish place in the world outside of Scotland. Hmm. And they say that over 50% of all residents of PEI have Scottish roots. Somewhere around 155,000 in population. But only 60,000, according to your census, identify as Canadian. They identify as Scottish, over 50,000. English, from England, 38,000. 37,000 Irish, 28,000 French. The largest visible majority in, or excuse me, the largest visible minority in PEI is Chinese. I read an interesting article today on the plane that says, the oldest running family restaurant in PEI is a Lebanese food restaurant. We could stop at 97.4% white and say, we don't really have a need for multicultural ministries here. And, that, and you would be saying, we don't have nothing in the house. And I'm humbly looking back at us to say, oh, there's something in the house. It might not seem like a whole lot, but there's something in the house. New Finland at over half a million, 39%, 200,000 are, are listing themselves as not Canadian as much as they are England or English, 19% Irish, 30,000 Scottish, 28,000 French, 16,000 indigenous. I'm saying here today that even in the Atlantic District, you've heard some statistics from Brother Raymart today, 80-some thousand, I, I, I don't want to misquote him, but all the immigrants that are coming here, here's what I'm saying tonight. We've got something in the house. 
There's a miracle in the house. The potential for revivals in the house already. The potential for a breakthroughs in the house. The potential for the next wave of revival that will crash in the Atlantic District. It's already in the house. Hallelujah. It's already here. The immigrants are coming. They're coming from everywhere. There's something about this place that they love. There's something about this place that's drawing them here. I believe it's the church. Hallelujah. I believe it's, it's the church of the living God that is, is strong in in this, in this region and strong in this district. Hallelujah. I'm sure somebody can list all kinds of other reasons why they're coming. But let me tell you, they are coming. And the house is growing with potential. The house is growing with possibility. The house is brimming and growing with the opportunity for revival. Hallelujah. How do we reach the access challenge countries around the world? Here's what I say. Win them in our house. And they can go to those countries where they're not going to allow a missionary. They're going to walk in because they already got a passport. They've already got a visa. They don't have to have permission from nobody. We might win them right here in North America. They might go to college right here at NCC. They might work in your community and be won by someone in your local church. But when God transforms their life, they'll be able to walk to a country that is bordered and challenged and surrounded by all kinds of barriers, and they'll walk right in the door. Because I can tell somebody here today, the miracle is already in the house. Hallelujah. I'm not a prophet, nor the son of the prophet. But let me tell you, you're going to hear it being testified at general conference. When inside of the next five years, you're going to hear it. I believe it with all my being. You're going to hear our general global missions director and others saying, we have been trying to get in this province. We have been trying to get in this region for decades. But we won somebody here in North America. They got the Holy Ghost in an apostolic united Pentecostal church. And God called them to go back home. And there was no barrier There was no restriction. They were here on a student visa. They were here on a worker visa. But God led them to go home. And now we've got a missionary in places where we've been trying to get a missionary. That's what I believe is going to happen. That's what's already happening in the Congo with Brother Pablo. We went for years not having a missionary there. But look what God is doing. Look what God is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What we have to do is we have to come back to our perspective, what we really have. In John 4, I believe it is, Jesus had to refocus those disciples' attention. They stopped at a well outside of Samaria. And those Jewish disciples, they were already doing too much in their mind just to go into that city and look for lunch. You ever thought about this? It was 12 plus Jesus, 13 people. Normally you send one guy to get lunch. Jesus sent them all. Tell me he wasn't doing something. So here's the thing. Jesus is at the well. The disciples leave. They go down the road into the city. The Samaritan woman comes. He ministers to her. She gets all kinds of victory. She leaves, goes back in the city. The disciples come back. Come here, Brother Terrible. I, I, I want you just to visualize this, okay? So Jesus is here. The disciples go to the city, and the Samaritan woman comes to Jesus. Then the Samaritan woman goes back, and then the disciples come back. This is why Jesus looked at them and said, what is wrong with you? Don't look at me and tell me that we don't have a harvest here. You passed her twice. This woman had the potential with her terrible reputation To bring the whole city out. The whole city came when she was converted. When the Lord touched her life, 
even though she had the worst reputation in town at that well at an odd hour today because of no doubt her, her problems she had had in her past, she still had the ability through her testimony, a miraculous testimony. She said, let me tell you about a man who told me all I ever did. And she brought an entire an entire community came out to hear Jesus because of this woman's word. And the disciples walked past her on the way into the city. They walked past her on the way back from the city. And Jesus said, don't you dare tell me that we don't have a revival here. Don't tell me we don't have a harvest. Can I look at somebody here today and with all humility say, we are passing by revival every day. We are driving past in our neighborhood. We are, we are walking past them in the hallways at our high schools and junior high and on our jobs. Can I tell somebody here today, there is a miracle in the house. We just got to get back to looking and seeing. There's value there. There's, a, there's an outpouring there. There's a breakthrough there. Let's not walk past a miracle that God has destined for us. Let's not walk past a revival. Let's not just walk past and say, oh, we need to have revival in Atlantic District. I don't have nothing in my house. I don't have nothing in my house. The Lord is saying, look right there. You're walking by her. You're walking by him. You're walking by that culture. I felt this drop in my spirit while I was taking a shower this afternoon. Some of these cultures in in our community here in, in the Atlantic District, these cultures of, of people, their numbers are very small. Hundreds. Lebanese and PEI, not even 500. But what's the biggest church in PEI? I have no idea. Could be a 10 million, I don't know. What's the largest church in PEI? 500 seems like a lot of people to be focused on. There's 150,000 population. Could your church tend to grow a little bit from a group of 500 people that are collectivist mentality. I'm going to say something that might make you a little nervous, but this is truth. In the United States, at least, we win white folks one at a time. It used to be very different, particularly in the South where I'm from. When I was a kid growing up, thank you, Brother Terrible, everybody that I knew would go to a family reunion every, every summer. They don't do that no more. Us white folk, we're trying to stay away from each other. We ain't spending no time. (laughs) I asked some of my Spanish friends, how big's your family? It's like 80, 90. Well, who in the world? How How many uncles and aunts do you have? Well, I got all these cousins. When it gets beyond first cousins, I don't even feel like I'm related to them. I don't want no responsibility for these folks. I don't want no, 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 no. I don't care what you do. You commit a crime, win the lottery, nothing. You're over there. That's our culture. But all of these cultures that are immigrating to North America, they see things different. So I say, yeah, we, we, can, we can overlook the value of a small community of hundreds. But when you win one, you may literally win 50 people. Because when one is converted, what, what, could, what could a family that represents two or three immediate nuclear families that come out to be about 25, 30 people. What could a revival of 30 people do to most of the churches in any church in the Atlantic District right now? Here's what I say. Don't, don't look at how small that pot of oil is. Don't, don't look at, at what, how insignificant it might seem because I'm going to tell you, there's miracle there. <laughs> there is miracle in the house. There is miracle, there is miracle, there is miracle in the house. Hallelujah. We know her story. As it ends, the prophet gave her this strategy. Go get other vessels. Not a few of them. He even used the phrase, your neighbor's vessel. The strategy for her miracle was she was going to take all that she had left and pour it into other people's vessel. Those vessels in the house, they weren't hers. She filled her house with other vessels. And I can tell you there's such a key here to revival. Because when we start taking what we have, and pouring it into other people's vessels, what the Lord says, 
If you'll do the addition, I'll do the multiplication. If you'll just take what you have, put it in my hand, pour it out. As long as she was pouring into other people's vessels, it kept multiplying. As long as she was pouring out of herself, out of her living, out of her sacrifice, as long as she was pouring her testimony, as long as she was pouring what she had into the vessels of the neighbor and the person down the street and those from another community, as long as she was pouring it into other vessels, the oil kept pouring out of that little vial of oil that she had. It was only when she had to stop pouring in other people's vessels that the miracle stopped. Can I say the, 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 the victory that we need is keep pulling more and more vessels let's bring them in the house let's bring them in the house Let, let's keep pouring out hallelujah you may not know the language use globaltracks.com find someone who knows you may not know the culture you don't have to the, the, the language of love speaks louder than any cultural barrier just love people ask questions they'll, they'll tell you the answers ask them about their culture they'll tell them tomorrow I'm going to teach about this for a little while in the morning but can I tell you the language of love is the greatest language in all the world if you'll just pour what you have into their vessel God is going to do a miraculous work in closing, as the musicians come, I realize tonight that I've been speaking to the majority of people in the room, but I, I want to take this last four minutes here that I have, and I want to speak to those in the room that are the minority in respect that there's not a hundred other people here that look like you tonight. Her name was not mentioned in the Bible. Neither was her age nor her family name. All we know about her is that she was a little maid. That's the, that's the words the Bible uses. A little maid working for the wife of the general of the Syrian army. At best, she was a servant likely she had been brought there against her will during one of Syria's many raids into Israel. If that was all we knew about her, we could presume that she had very little influence at all. We could assume that there was not much that she could do. However, in 2 Kings chapter 5, we see that despite her station as being displaced, she was willing to step in when she saw a need. It was not likely that someone in her position could have a voice or be valued or have any influence. But the reality was that when the need was there, she became used of God to see one of the most powerful, notable, biblical miracles that you will ever read. Naaman was not just a soldier, but he was a captain. Most other Bible translations call him a commander. And he was not just a commander, but he was quite famous in Syria. He was said to be a mighty man of valor. And by his hand, the word says, the Lord used him to bring victory to Syria. The Jewish rabbis would say that it was Naaman's arrow that slew King Ahab. The King James Version doesn't tell us anything about the one who pulled the drawstring on that bow, but their tradition says it was Naaman. There's quite a status and power differential at play here. She was a nameless unknown. He was a celebrated hero. She was an immigrant. He was a celebrity of the majority culture in their community. She was perhaps a slave. He was the commander of the army. But yet when Naaman became sick with leprosy, it was her word alone that set in motion a chain of events that led to the complete healing of Naaman the commander. She was there in the house all the time. 
So I'm preaching to our majority culture tonight, and I'm telling you, look in the house. Because there's a miracle in the house. And I'm preaching to those of you that are immigrants and have come to this place from other parts of the world, and you spend most of your days separated from the millions and the masses in the place of origin that you are from. And I'm speaking to you tonight, and I'm saying, you're in the house. You see, I would be failing in my job as multicultural ministries director if I spent all of my ministry preaching to the majority culture and telling them to win minority cultures. That is just far too low of a goal in the eyes of this great God that we have. Because I believe there's an anointing spirit of the little maid in a general's house that can bring the supernatural, the miracles. Don't sit here today isolated from many of your friends and family and feel like you don't have something. I want to tell you, the next big wave of revival in this district could come from someone who doesn't look like me and who doesn't look like my friend, Brother Carter. It could come from someone that's only been living here for the past couple of years because you're in the house. <laughs> you're in the house. And God wants to use you in this house. God wants to multiply. And I will tell you, when you feel that Holy Ghost anointing to begin to speak up, God wants to put heaven's microphone at your lips. Because you are a miracle in the house. You are the miracle in the house. I wonder if we just lift our hands right now. Stand if you will, but lift your hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands right now. Hallelujah. For some of us tonight, we, we need to reconcile our feelings and our emotions about our inadequacy. Hallelujah. For some of us, we need to, we need to realize, listen, I've been trying to figure out how to do this, but I just need to get back to the mandate that God's called me to do this. I, I got to do this because there's a miracle in the house. There's a miracle in the house. How, there's revival in my community. There's a breakthrough in my community. What do I have in my house? I've got a lot more than nothing. I've got a symbol of God's anointing, and I've got a symbol of God's outpouring. As they begin to sing, this altar is open right now. I wonder if somebody would step down and say, Lord, give me a revelation of the miracle that's in the house. Lord, give me contact. Put me in contact with a miracle in the house. Lord, allow me to speak up and be that miracle. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of those, those few phrases in the New Testament where it says things like this. And the saints in Caesar's house salute you. While Caesar would cross the street to the Colosseum to see Christians killed, there were Bible studies and prayer meetings happening in his house. Don't ever allow the power of what's in the house to be eclipsed by our issues and our circumstances. There's a miracle.